Amen. Amen. We'll pray for the ladies' Sunday school class. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, anyone? Anyone? Uh, Miss Nora. Amen. Yes, ma'am. And the Lord can do that. When I when I worked for my dad as his assistant, uh, you know, we uh, we had a couple come, and the doctor told them the same thing: they weren't they wouldn't be able to. They had had a child previously, but they, they were telling them they wouldn't be able to have a child again because of some medical things. And we prayed over the couple and anointed them with oil, and you know, sure enough, they had a child. Haven't they had another? Another one? Yeah, they had another one. Yeah. And um, boy, that was a neat couple that the husband, the dad, um, they were in our Sunday school class. We had a, cu a married couples class. Right. And so the, the lady got saved and baptized and she was a sweetheart. Well, her husband was sort of, you know, a little stubborn. And so, you know, he got saved. Well, he wasn't really wanting to get baptized. Um, maybe I strong armed him into the baptistry. I don't know. I know that I grabbed his arm and said, let's go, brother. The Lord would like you to do this. And <laughs> needless to say. He got baptized and he was terrified. He was scared of water. And uh, but he got baptized, you know, so. Um, but anyway, so the Lord can answer that prayer. I can answer prayer. Uh, Brother Billy. Yes, sir. And what's her name? Janet. Joyce. Okay. Definitely. Yes, sir. Okay. And good to see you, Brother Billy. Miss Cheryl, did you? Wow. Is that with the voting? That's what that is involved in? Because I know you've done that for, for a while. Okay. So you're... Wow. Wow. Yeah, yes, ma'am. We will pray for that. Right. Wow. Amen. Amen. Thank, thanks for looking up for Elizabeth City. Amen. Amen. Wow. No, that's great. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Tears, huh? Oh, yes. Yep. The little Jemima, she is cute as a button. And uh, doing doing just fine. Yes, we have him on here. Yep, your Uncle Ben planting a church. Right, amen, amen. Anyone else before we go to the Lord in prayer? Okay, and be sure to hold on to this, this prayer list and use it to pray over until next Wednesday. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight, Lord, for the opportunity to come to your house, Lord, as Lord, just brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. No one is better than anyone else, Lord. And God, I thank you for the, giving us the opportunity to come to you in prayer. Please forgive us of our sins, Lord, and Lord, forgive us for failing you in our shortcomings, Lord. Thank you for being faithful and loving us and forgiving us. Lord, we thank you for your blessings upon our church, the visitors on Sunday, Lord, the people that were saved on Saturday. And um, God, we thank you for continuing, it seems week after week, uh, to bring new people to our church. Thank you for our piano, Lord, that you provided for us. Lord, we lift our brother Kelvin's brother, Manuel, Lord. He just had a heart attack. Lord, if anything, I pray that this... Um, that this accident, Lord, this heart attack that he's had will help him realize the, the shortness and the brevity of this life. And Lord, if he's not saved, that he would get saved. And Lord, if he's already saved, that he would focus his life on serving you, realizing that it could be gone at any moment, Lord. Also, Lord, we pray that Brother Kelvin would get this job, Lord, with the ICPTA uh, bus line, Lord. And I pray that you provide this job for him, Lord, and that you give him the strength to work in it and to do well. Lord, we pray for our on law enforcement Sunday this week, Lord, it's just about upon us. And Lord, I pray as people come and there will be people and there will be visitors, Lord, I believe that. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the uh, flyers that have been passed out. And I pray as the gospel is given that we'd see people saved, Lord, and people's lives impacted, Lord, for all of eternity. Uh, Lord, we lift up Mrs. Diane Whitley. And the Lord at home tonight, she's struggling and has been for the last couple of weeks. Lord, we love her and Brother Richard. Lord, I pray that you give her strength, Lord, and maybe... If it be possible, over the next couple of weeks, she'd be able to join us again for service, Lord. Be with her husband, Lord, as he looks out for and takes care of things. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would give us wisdom in making 
wise decisions with our parking lot, Lord. We don't want to be rash and just go out and spend a lot of money. But also, Lord, we want to we want to get things done and make your house look as good as we can afford to, Lord. And give us wisdom. Put the right people in our path, Lord. We pray for our local and, and uh, state and our federal leaders and officials, Lord, that they make wise decisions, Lord. And um, God, we lift up our church planners tonight, Brother Andrew Merritt, Brother White House, the Scary family, uh, Brother Jacob, uh, Barry and his dear wife. We pray for my brother as they're um, getting a lot of work done and getting all the preparations with church gospel tracts and all that. I pray you give them wisdom, Lord, and already work in the hearts of the people in that grass field area, Lord, uh, that they'd be able to reach for Christ. Uh, Lord, we lift up uh, uh, Steve, Lord, the brother of Miss Patty, and Lord just had a stint put in and yet still has cancer. God, I pray that you encourage him, Lord, even though he may be struggling physically, I pray that his trust in you would go stronger and stronger, Lord, and that it would overcome any physical difficulties he may have. Lord, Lord we pray for the son and a wife of Miss Nora, Lord, and God, I pray that they would be able to have a child, Lord, as they're requesting, Lord, and um, God, if you'd want them to have children, Lord, and you want to bless them that way, I pray that you would do that, Lord, and help them to trust in you while they wait on you. Lord, we lift up a good friend of uh, Brother Billy and his wife, Amy, Lord, Miss Joyce, who had to be airlifted, Lord. And I pray that she would be okay, that you would help the doctors get her stabilized and she'd be able to be home by the end of the week, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd give Miss Cheryl wisdom, Lord. Give her much wisdom in decision making and in the training, Lord. And in a judge position, there are decisions to be made. And sometimes it can be difficult to decide between right and wrong. I pray you give her wisdom, Lord. And also with dealing with people, Lord, I pray that you would help her, Lord, and help her to make a good influence, an honest influence um, in our community. Um, Lord, we just thank you for all the blessings you've given to us. Bless our uh, service and the sermon tonight, Lord. May it speak to our hearts and to our minds. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to go to my favorite book of the Bible, probably. I have to say my favorite book of the Bible, to the book of Proverbs tonight. My wife is grinning at me. Proverbs is probably my favorite book of the Bible. And I had to take a long break from preaching in Proverbs because we had that 31 week series on Proverbs where we did a chapter every single uh, week. And so. I but if I had a choice between, you know, that only I can only pick after after I was saved and I can only pick one book of the Bible to read. Proverbs might very well be that Proverbs is there's so much application in Proverbs. Now, Proverbs does not teach us. Um, how to evangelize next necessary. It does not teach us how to organize a church. It does not teach us the requirements of bishops and deacons. It does not teach us a lot of that. But the life lessons that are found in the book of Proverbs, if you don't have those, everything you learn in the New Testament and the other books, it's really not going to help. For example, the book of Proverbs will teach you the wisdom and the knowledge and the instruction and the humility you need. And then when you get to the New Testament, you learn about the other finer details of the Christian life and the New Testament church. You need all those applicable life lessons from the book of Proverbs, okay? Because if you don't have that biblical character and that integrity and that kindness and the wisdom that Proverbs teaches you, all of that information you're going to get in the New Testament, it's not really going to help you unless you're grounded. So the book of Proverbs um, is is one of my top recommended books for new Christians, especially uh, for especially for young men that are just saved. They get saved, and I make sure they understand salvation. They say, "Hey, I want you to read a chapter of Proverbs every single day." And so we're going to go through Proverbs now. I, I've entitled this tonight. Good, a neat title. Tonight we're going to talk about the wise man of Proverbs. When you read through the book of Proverbs, there's 31 chapters, and there is the wise man, and of course, contrasted is the foolish man. Then there's the forward man. There's the simple man, who is, you know, basically a foolish person. Not, not. You don't want to be the simple man, okay? That not simple in a good way, but a wise man. Um, the book of Proverbs gives us uh, 10 specific verses that has the words "wise man" in them, and of those 10 verses, we're going to look at. Um, all 10 of them, but we have nine points and what the Bible describes as a wise man. Now, man referring to a wise man or a wise woman. So we could say a wise person. I want to be a wise person. A better way to phrase that would be I need to be a wise person. Hey, um, I could understand everything in the New Testament and Revelation and First, Second Timothy and have all the qualifications of a bishop and a pastor. But if I'm not a wise man, I'm not going to make a very good pastor. I could be a talented preacher. 
a talent, you know, you could be a talented singer, you could be a good Sunday school teacher, you could be a good organizer, you could be a good soul winner. But if you're not a wise person, all that skill that it's 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 not going to last. You need wisdom, and you need to be a wise person. How are you going to be a good husband, or how are you going to be a good wife, or how are you going to be a good father, or how are you going to be just a good person, in community? If you don't have wisdom, it reminds me of. Do you remember in the New Testament in First Corinthians 13 where it's talking about charity, and it basically says that you know that if you have if you have all knowledge, remember that, and you understand all mystery. In other words, you know everything about everything, even in the Bible. But if you don't have charity, boy, it's nothing. It's almost worth it. it profits you nothing. A similar thing could be said about being wise and having wisdom. And so tonight, if we're going to be wise people, we need to see what the Bible says about a wise person. And as we read through these, I want you to pick out in your mind at least one, perhaps two or three of these that you in, that you specifically can work on. You say, Pastor, I see that in the Bible. This is an area I need to work on. I want to be a wiser person. I need to be a wiser person. And so as we go through these, not, I guarantee you some of these will help. Um, Number one, number one, go to Proverbs chapter one and verse five. Now, we're going to start in the beginning of Proverbs and work our way through. And then there's one verse in Ecclesiastes that we're going to look at just because it's so good. I don't want to miss it. So Proverbs chapter one. So point number one, a wise man will be quiet and listen. A wise man will be quiet and listen. Now, Proverbs chapter one, verse five, a and those two words are say it. Wise man. Proverbs chapter one, verse five. Ready? A wise man will hear and will increase learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel so if you're going to be wise you've got to learn to be quiet and to listen so if you're talking all the time you're never going to hear if you're not paying attention you're definitely not going to hear and if you're a wise person if you want god to consider you as a wise person you're going to have to learn to be quiet and to listen Hey, that doesn't just go for at church, but that can go for at home. That can go while you're out and about. Listen to people and try to learn from them. Okay, if you're always teaching and you're never listening, you are not a wise person. As we go through this list, you could flip every single verse around. If God says a wise man will hear and will increase learning, you could flip that around and say a foolish man will not hear and a foolish man will not increase in learning. Hey, make sure you're listening. Make sure you're listening to the preaching. And I'm not just saying that because I'm preaching. I want you to listen to me. But even if I wasn't preaching, listen to the man of God as he's teaching and preaching the word of God. Listen in Sunday school. Hey, if you're listening uh, even to some extra sermons from the week, make sure that you're paying attention. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. Hey, that takes some humility because first you have to realize that maybe you don't know everything. You have to realize that maybe you're wrong about some things and you need to be quiet and listen. A wise man recognizes that he needs instruction. Um, a wise man that's in his 40s recognizes he needs to learn and will hear and increase learning. But also a wise man, even in their 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s, you never grow out of that phase of not learning because that Bible verse does not just have an expiration date. OK, um, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. Um, number two, go to Proverbs chapter nine. Proverbs chapter, and these are all very, very simple, but so profound, so profound. Um, Proverbs chapter number nine, and this point number two is a wise man can handle rebuke. Oh, that just that word has a terrible, a terrible sound to it. A wise man can handle rebuke. Look at Proverbs chapter nine, verse eight. The Bible says, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a, what's it say? Wise man, and he will love thee. So the opposite of a wise man here is a what God is listing is a scorner. So God is contrasting a wise man with a scorner. Someone who's always um, mocking and arguing and attacking. You know, they're scorning or scoffing. They're skeptical, maybe would be a good word for it. But the Bible says that a wise man, if you rebuke him, and rebuke is a strong word. Um, you, there's the word reprove. There's the word correction. The word rebuke, I believe, is the strongest of those three. And so rebuke would almost be a face-to-face, man-to-man, belly-to-belly, in spitting distance. You know, you're really rebuking someone and saying, hey, uh, I just got to tell you, buddy, you're wrong. And you're going the absolute wrong direction. Sometimes you have to do that. Can I get an amen? Some Now, not all the time, okay? If that's the only thing you know how to do is rebuke people, you're going to be a miserable person to be around. But every now and then, you need to 
get in someone's face, say, look, I just want to tell you, you are going the wrong direction. Um, I, I based counsel with someone a couple times the last few weeks, and in very simple terms, I said, brother, you are going the wrong direction. Don't do this. You're going the wrong direction. I almost want to get uh, the, uh, the highway signs that say wrong way, and I just want to put it right in front of his face. But if you're a wise man, you can handle rebuke, and that rebuke causes you to love the correction. You don't love it in the moment, okay? It stings and it hurts, but you appreciate it because you're learning from it. And so if you cannot handle being corrected without getting your feelings hurt and getting upset and getting angry and getting bitter, you are not a wise person. Hey, in church, sometimes when I'm preaching, um, I try my best to put, to put the scriptures out in a way I don't want to preach at people, but I want to preach to people and bring us all along. I'm not trying to single anyone out, but if you're in a sermon and it steps on your toes and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit convicts you and that makes you angry, you need to have some wisdom. Because if you're a wise person and you get rebuked, the Bible says a rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. So a character trait of being wise is being able to handle correction. Do you handle rebuke? Again, that verse has no expiration date. Now, um, I'll just read it because it'll take us out of order. But in Proverbs 17, it says, A reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. So it'd be like you have two men. You have a wise man over here and a fool on this side. And you're trying to teach them. What are we going to try to teach them? You're going to try to teach them to sit up in church and to pay attention. The fool over here, boy, you know, you tell him sit up in church. And he doesn't sit up in church. So you you lash at him 15 times. He still doesn't sit up in church. You lash him What's it say there? 100. Um, you lash him 100 stripes, and then he finally sits up in church in front of the wise man and say, hey, you need to sit up in church. Yes, sir. And they sit right up in church. A wise man, all you've got to do is give a simple reproof. You know, God can correct in the best way. You know, God will chasten his own children, and God can chasten you in your life in a way that nobody else can. If you're a wise person, all God has to do is just give you that little nudge, maybe from your Bible reading, maybe from a sermon. God gives you that little nudge, and boy, you straighten right up. If you're a foolish Christian and a foolish person, God might have to lay into you and give you a hundred stripes. I don't want God to have to whip me on the back 100 times in my life to get the message across. But a wise man can handle that rebuke. A wise man, you don't have to beat him over the head with it. You just send and say, hey, buddy, you're, um, I don't know if that's the right direction. And instantly they can autocorrect, okay? Um, number, uh, number three, a wise man is teachable. A wise man is teachable. Look at Proverbs. You're in Proverbs chapter 9. Look at verse 9. Give instruction to a, what's it say? Wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. So a wise man has to be willing and humble enough to receive instruction. And instruction would be, just as the word sounds, if you are following instructions to assemble something, it's very detailed. Okay. Sometimes, in the, especially in the Sunday morning time when I'm preaching a message, it's a very generic truth, okay? It's reminding people to serve God, reminding people to trust God, reminding people to, uh, uh, to find comfort in the Lord. It's reminding people to be kind to their neighbors. It's generic Bible truths, and we need that. But on a Wednesday night, or especially in a Sunday school and in the class that I'm teaching now, there are some very direct things. Don't do that. That's bad, okay? And these are the 25 reasons why that's bad. That is instruction. Hey, pastor, I, I got saved. What should I wear? Okay, I'm going to give you detailed instruction. This is how men should dress according to the Bible, and these are the dress standards for ladies. Uh, pa uh, pastor, I'm married. How do I conduct myself as a husband or wife? Okay, it's very detailed. And so a wise man is able to receive that instruction, even if it's very detailed. He can follow instructions, okay? Um, sometimes uh, growing up, we have a hard time following instructions. You know, we forget and we miss it all up. So a wise man can handle rebuke, but a wise man's teach, but you could sit them down and say, okay, this is how you do it. Step one. Okay, check. I got that done. Step two and step three. They're thorough. They're diligent, okay? Um, a wise man can receive that instruction, and the Bible says, as a result, he will be yet wiser. Now, here's a next one. Here's a good one. Um, number four, a wise man avoids trouble if possible. A wise man avoids trouble if possible. There's a verse in the New Testament that says, if if it be possible, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. God knows there are going to be some times when you cannot live peaceably with all men, but as much as possible, you want to. Go to Proverbs chapter 14. 
Proverbs chapter 14. So if we're going to be wise people, wise Christians, we've got to follow the biblical examples God has given us. Proverbs 14 and verse 16. Proverbs 14 and 6, verse 16. And the Bible says, A wise man, you see it? A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. Boy, that will get a lot of people in trouble. Being overconfident is a term we use. A wise man, he can uh, see that some problems, some evil are coming, and he's able to avoid uh, trouble if possible. He sees the evil coming and he's departing from it, okay? That's not just referring to evil as a sin, but it seems as if it's appointed to maybe some trouble that's ahead. The foolish person, he's so confident, man, he got it. He got it. He, he's got it now. He can handle it. He knows what he's doing. He's so confident. He's just raging. He's ready to meet the trouble head on. He's ready to meet this. But the wise man, as the Bible says, he fears because he knows the consequences of the trouble. He knows that he could be hurt or his family could be hurt and he departs from evil. Okay, so be wise when you're dealing with situations. Be wise when you're dealing with people. If you're not if you're not careful, you can push people away from the Lord, uh, not because they were mad at the Bible, but because you made them mad at you. OK, if you're talking to someone and you can already sense this conversation is not going the right way, don't be that fool and be so overconfident. That, Bless God, I'm going to tell him and they're going to understand. No, sometimes you need to have some fear. Boy, I don't I want to I don't want I want another chance to win this person to Christ. You need to just fear and depart from evil. OK, um, and so, you know, of course, there are going to be times when you, you have to confront the problem. But a wise man has discretion. He can see his surroundings. He can see the decisions. And he can see there's evil ahead, and he's able to depart from that evil, okay? Um, that would be like, you know, not getting in arguments that, that are not necessary, okay? You say, well, I know that I'm right. I know you know that you're right, and you probably are right, but a wise man, he fears what could happen. As a result of the argument, he just departs from evil. He completely leaves the, leaves the situation. Now, number five, okay, go to Proverbs 16, Proverbs chapter 16. These are all character traits, descriptions, adjectives of a wise man. Number five, a wise man can de-escalate the situation. De-escalate the situation. Okay, part of being a wise man is to de-escalate the situation. When I was on the ride along on Monday night with the officer, I asked him about, you know, some of his most common calls. And one of the most common ones was just like domestic disturbances. You know, the husband and wife arguing, throwing stuff at each other and uh, the, neighbor, the neighbor calling. He says, what I do is when I come into that situation, I try to separate them and I make them talk to me and not through me. And so rather than, you know, the, the wife yelling past him to the husband and the husband yelling past him to the wife, he separates them and he does his best by his body language, um, by his words to de-escalate the situation. That's an excellent police officer, by the way. Okay, that's exactly what we need. We don't need the police officer to come in there and to ramp things up. We need them to de-escalate the situation. I don't know if I'd want to have that job, just saying, okay? I mean, that life is stressful enough without having to deal with other people's problems. Proverbs 16, verse 14, if you're not there yet, verse 14, the wrath of a king is as messengers of death, but a, what's it say? Wise man will pacify. A pacifier we would give to a baby to calm them down. Now, Jemima does not like her pacifier, okay? You give Jemima a pacifier and she screams more because she's angry, okay? They even make these pacifier things that you, well, you might not have seen, but they wrap around the head and they're to help hold the pacifier in there. And uh, so, you know, even sometimes they try to give those to babies to calm them down. So imagine the king sending out an order and the king's upset. And back in that day, the king didn't have to go through Congress. He didn't have to go through the Senate. He didn't have to go through anyone. If he wanted somebody's head, he could have it on a platter at any moment. So a wise man, the king is upset about something. He is wise enough to de-escalate that situation. He can say, hey, 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 hold up, hold up. Hey, let, let's talk about what exactly is going on. You have to be wise in order to do that. You have to be um, humble enough to uh, bring yourself down and to step back. So part of being a wise person is to de-escalate the situation. And we can prevent a lot of problems in our relationships if we will learn to de-escalate the situation. How many marriages have been ruined because the husband or because the wife was not wise enough to de-escalate the situation, to step back and to calm down. Hey, how many relationships at your job have been ruined or now you're miserable at your job because something came up and rather than de-escalating the situation, you had to stand your ground and you had to argue about it and you just made things worse. 
Sometimes to de-escalate the situation, you've got to humble yourself and even apologize for something maybe when you didn't even do it wrong. You ever felt that you were in the right, but you know that if you say I'm right, it's going to make things worse? Just say, hey, maybe I was wrong. I mean, I'm sorry about this. I didn't want to do it this way. A wise man, a wise woman, a wise person is able to de-escalate the situation. So part of being a wise man in God's eyes, okay? And we read when we read Proverbs, it's given us God's opinion on a wise man is to be able to de-escalate, to pacify that anger. Um, uh, number six, go to Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter number 21. Boy, I hope you're learning something tonight. Proverbs chapter 21. If we could take this to heart, it's very simple, but God gave us the book of Proverbs because we need it. Proverbs chapter 21. And number six, a wise man is a problem solver. He is a problem solver. This verse, I believe, this is the principle the Bible's trying to teach us. Verse 22, Proverbs 21, 22. A, what's it say? Wise man, scale it the city of the mighty and cast it down the strength of the confidence thereof. The biggest application I could draw from that would be a wise man is able to figure out how to get things done. He scales the city of the mighty. He's wise enough to figure out. He casts it down the confidence of the people that are defending that city. So a wise man is able to figure things out, okay? That's part of being wise. A wise man doesn't come to a problem and just throw his hands up in the air and say, I don't know what to do. I'm never going to figure out what to do and walk away. A wise man is able to sit down to reason, maybe to receive counsel and to figure the problem out. Life is full of problems. And if we don't get better at being problem solvers, either we're going to flunk at life or we're going to end up as losers or else we're just going to be miserable and never successful in anything. I want to be successful. Amen. It's not a sin to be successful. It's not a proud thing to be successful, but you cannot be successful if you're not wise. And if you're wise, you're going to have to learn to be a problem solver. Um, when we were growing up, my dad uh, was very hard on me to and to try to train me to be a better problem solver. My brother Benjamin, who is a year younger than I, uh, was very smart. Um, he had a photographic memory. At one time, he memorized like the first 10 chapters of Proverbs, and he didn't even really try that hard. Um, he could figure things out. So maybe my dad would say, boys, the washing machine is broken, and we might be 12 and 13 years of age. He'd say, boys, the washing machine's broken. I want you to go figure it out. You know, he would just give us, maybe check this or this. We didn't know what we were doing. So my brother, he just, he just figured things out naturally. And he's an electrician, and uh, I'm a pastor, okay? So he ended up get it, getting those skills. Um, so we would try to figure things out, and I would throw everything on him. I would try to look at it, get frustrated, give up, okay? And um, my some of my most used words in my, you know, 10, 11, 12 to 13 years of age was, I can't, I can't do it. And my dad would harp on me for saying, I can't do it, I can't do it. And eventually he tried to help me become a problem solver, okay? Because you can't just get to the middle of your life and just throw your hands over there and say, I can't do it no more. That doesn't work. That's not wise. A wise man is a problem solver. Um, number seven, number seven, go to Proverbs 24. And all of this is right here. It's right here in the Word of God. The Bible's trying to teach us how to be a wise person. This will help you in every area of your life. That's the greatest part of Proverbs. It doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. It doesn't matter whether you just got saved, you've been saved for a while, whether you're married, whether you're single. It doesn't matter. All of this stuff will help you be a better Christian and a better person. Um, number uh, seven, a wise man is not soft or weak. A wise man is not a softy. He's not a weak person. Uh, Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 5. The Bible says, A wise man is strong. Yea, a man of knowledge increaseth strength. Now, there are three types of strength. There is physical strength. The Bible says in Proverbs, The glory of young men is their strength. So young men should be physically strong. Amen. If we don't have young men that are physically strong, who's going to protect the country? Who's going to protect the city? Who's going to protect our capital? Okay, we need young men that are strong. So there is a physical strength. Then there is a mental strength. You're able to um, handle pressure. You're able to handle making decisions. And making decisions can put a lot of mental strain on you. In fact, if I had to, the top of the top two things, the top hardest things for me as a pastor, personally, one of the two, I won't tell you the other one, but one of the two is making decisions. Because at the end of the day, we can have everything before us, but we have to make a decision. And as a pastor, I have to be the one to say, this is what we're doing. So being strong mentally is part of being wise. Um, there's also a spiritually strong. In other words, when 
you hit a spiritual difficulty in your life, you don't just say, that's it, I give up on the Lord. You know, and then I just, that's it, I'm done. Be spiritually strong. That's part of being wise. There's also an emotional strength. In other words, you're not a roller coaster all the time, okay? There, there are going to be things that will trip you up, and you know what? It doesn't put you down in the dumps. If your life is, boy, woo, everything's great, everything's great, and then the next day you're down in the dumps, you know, and life is miserable and you hate yourself, you need to be even keel. When the good things happen, I mean, it's okay to be excited about it, but don't think that it's going to be this way forever. When the bad things happen, you know, don't get so down in the dumps about it, realize that the next day could bring a brighter future. So there's those kinds of strength physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. If I had to list them, I would say spiritually strong would be the most important. Secondly, I would say emotionally strong would be the next important. Third would be mentally strong. And lastly, would be physically strong. If you're spiritually strong, you'll stay close to the Lord no matter what. If you're emotionally strong, it will help you be a happy, content person no matter what happens in your life. Hey, if you're mentally strong, you'll be able to make good decisions. And if you're physically strong, that'll just you know help you live longer, be in better shape, and uh, won't put as much stress on your body, okay? But that would be the last of that. Now, number eight, go to Proverbs 29. Oh, this, this is so important right here. Proverbs chapter number 29, so helpful. Um, number eight, a wise man doesn't have to win every argument. A wise man doesn't have to win every argument. Boy, this is so important. You don't have to always be right. You don't always have to have the last word. And this is so difficult. Maybe not for you, but it's difficult for me. Proverbs 29 and verse 9. Look at this, verse 9. The Bible says, If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. In other words, a wise man will recognize that if he gets an, in an argument, not a discussion, but an actual argument or debate, whatever you want to call it, with a foolish person, okay, whether this man is uh, raging, whether he's angry, whether he's laughing, there's no rest, there's no solution, okay? So a wise man, he realizes he doesn't have to win every argument. We already read that a wise man will fear and depart from evil. So it would be wise to realize that if you're going to talk or get in discussion with a foolish person, Boy, you just depart from that evil. It doesn't matter whether you're upset or happy with them. It doesn't matter whether they're upset or happy. There's no rest. There's no solution. So the solution is just to walk away. When we go out soul winning and we see other people, maybe from another church, I will try to talk to them briefly, but 99.99999% of the time, all that it does is lead to an argument. It leads to a debate. And if they're not saved and if they're hardened to the scriptures, they qualify as a foolish person. And so I'm not going to contend with them. I'm going to realize the evil that's going to befall me because I'm going to spend all my time arguing with this guy on the street that has already rejected the gospel and God might have already given him up. And instead, I'm going to realize the evil from that. I'm going to depart from that. A wise man doesn't have to win every argument, and you can't. Boy, there are some people that, boy, you could, I mean, Jesus himself could come down from heaven and say, yeah, what he's saying is right. And they still, oh, that wasn't really Jesus. They wouldn't really believe it. Don't get into those arguments because all they do is, is spike your blood pressure. All they do is make that person mad at you. And all they do is just waste your time. If we're not careful, a wise person, he's not going to contend with a foolish man. There's no point in contending with a foolish man. There's another verse in the Bible. I don't have it here. And the Bible says, go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. I'll say it again. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Boy, if somebody comes to you and they want to learn and they have a question, those are the people who I sit down and I'll give you hours and hours of my time. But if you're just trying to cause me problems, if you're just trying to argue, I can tell by what you're saying, your attitude, your tone of voice, you're a foolish person. The Bible says just go from that person. Go from that person. And you can tell them, hey, if you ever need me, you know my number, but this conversation is over. I've had to do that as a pastor. I've had to do that personally, just with um, not between me and my wife, but just different family things and say, hey, we're not talking about this. This chapter of the book is closed, and that's it. We're just not going to go there because you have to recognize, a wise man can recognize that there's going to be foolish people out there, and there can be foolish people that are saved people, okay? I'm, we're just not just talking. There can be saved people that they're just, they're not wise. They're not, um, they're not looking at things through a biblical view. So a wise man, he doesn't have to win every argument. Remember, he can, he can, be, he can fear the evil, and he can depart from it. Um, number nine. And you're in Proverbs 29, look at verse 11. Number nine, a wise man doesn't always speak his mind. Doesn't always speak his mind. As much as I 
have a lot of admiration for our former president. He does have a problem with always speaking his mind and uh, would have made things a lot easier for him if he would exercise some wisdom. OK, Proverbs 29, 11. I said our former president. Stop giving me weird looks. OK, um, a fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it until afterwards. You know, maybe sometimes the wisest people are sometimes that are the people that are the most reserved. OK, you know, the most um, flamboyant people, the people that are always talking. Boy, the more you talk, the easier it is to say something wrong. Um, that, that when you're when you're a preacher or you're a you know, pastor and you preach and you talk for a living, you have to be extra careful because out of the hours and hours of talking you do per week, you're bound to slip up and say something that you ought not. But a foolish person, boy, he just lays it all out there. Even if it's good information and you're teaching or trying to counsel someone, the, the Bible never says just unload on them. Uh, only a foolish person would just utter all their mind. Boy, make sure that they're saved. Amen. Make sure that after they get saved, they know where's our little thing that they need to get baptized. But you don't have to unload on them. Hey, maybe they make a mistake. You don't have to unload. Only a foolish person would utter all their mind. Even if your mind is full of the word of God, it doesn't mean that you've got to just unload on them. A wise man, he keeps it until after. He's wise enough to realize, you know what? This, this is just too much of them. We, I can't talk to them about this right now. They cannot. They can't handle the information. Let me give them some time. Boy, this will save you from um, ruining a lot of friendships and relationships. If you're not careful, you'll just utter all of your mind and say whatever you want to say, whenever you want to say it, and that's never okay to do. Even if it's the Word of God, even if it's Scripture, the Bible says that this is, this is a blanket verse, a fool uttereth all his mind. As a preacher, if I said everything that I wanted to say, I could drive some people off unnecessarily. I could rub some people the wrong way. And what I do is when I type up my sermons, a lot of times when I'm looking over my notes, I'll take this pen that I never have on me and I will scratch stuff off. I'll scratch stuff off because in the privacy of me studying and preparing the sermon, I put some notes in there, things I was going to say. And as I look over it and I imagine myself preaching, I say, you know what? That's a true statement. That's a true statement. I know that it's right, but you know what? I don't need to utter that. I don't need to throw everything out there, and I'll scratch it off, and it, will, it won't come into the service. There have been times when I've looked over my notes, and I've said, how is that in my notes? How could I ever say that to anybody, okay? Only a foolish person, even a preacher, only a foolish person would utter all the matter. A wise man, he keeps it in till afterwards because he's using it in the right way. Hey, learn to hold your peace. Now, we this is... I don't have a point for this one, but it's so good that we got to look at it. And it's close. Ecclesiastes 10. Take a short little trip out of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 12. We'll finish up with this. Finish up with this. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 12. The Bible says the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. In other words, a fool, he talks so much and what he says or how he says it, he's, to, he's shooting himself in the foot. He's destroying himself by the words it says. But part of being a wise man is being gracious. Learn to be gracious with people and people will enjoy being around you more. Work at being gracious with people. People will listen to you more. People will trust you more. And uh, that's part of being wise. So I don't know about you, but this is very convicting. The Bible right here has laid out some principles and I'll go in over them and review in just a minute, but these principles can help you in every area of your life. If I got up here tonight and I taught about, you know, being a witness for Christ, and we do teach about that, and that's important, but that's mainly going to help you in that category. But what I taught tonight, as simple as it is, will help you be a better witness for Christ. If you're not gracious with your words, you're not wise. If you're not wise, you're not going to have God's blessing. If you don't have God's blessing, how are you going to be a good soul? Hey, what I taught you tonight will help in your marriage and your family and your job and being a Christian and having a good testimony. If you're not a wise Christian man or a wise Christian woman, how are you going to please the Lord? You're either wise or foolish. There's only one other side of this. So what we've looked at tonight can help you in every area of your life. And if we're not careful, sometimes as Christians, we, we go to the New Testament where it's exciting and all these details are in. And boy, all that stuff's good and we need that knowledge and information, but that's not going to help us if we don't have problems if we don't have the wisdom to exercise that knowledge or if we, we need the wisdom to exercise that knowledge in review then we'll be done a wise man will be quiet and listen 
A wise man can handle rebuke. A wise man is teachable. A wise man avoids trouble if possible. A wise man can de-escalate the situation. A situ situation. A wise man is a problem solver. A wise man's not soft or weak. A wise man doesn't have to win every argument. A wise man doesn't always speak his mind. Boy, I hope this was a help and a blessing to you. Um, Brother Philip and uh, Ms. Long, if you come up for our closing song. Boy, let's put this into practice this week, and let's go ahead and stand for closing song. Of course, we have the Saturday soul winning um, at 10 o'clock, and um, we will continue working on the parking lot stuff. Hopefully, have an update for you with that on Sunday. So, Philip, come and lead us. Thank you. Your blue hymnals page number 604, 604. It's a grand thing to be a Christian, and we can apply some good truths and lessons tonight to be a better Christian. 604, and once we're done, you'll be dismissed. Safe travels back home, everybody. Here we go.